So who are you? I mean, think about how we live so defeated. And I told you at the beginning of this, I, I, not that I wanted to go all the way back and say, the devil's after us and sin and chains and all this other stuff. Man, I wanted to get to this part. For us to understand that God has saved us for a reason. God's commissioned us. God has called us. God has equipped us. God has a plan for us and is much, much bigger than just coming to church on Sunday. So Mark chapter 5 again. We're going to finish this story of the maniac of Gadara. We have such a small view of God's plan for our life. We make it just about, you know, I, I think when we talk about uh, I, you know, I, I once was lost, but now I'm found. We, we, we emphasize on the I once was lost part and not the I, I am now found part. We, we are sinners saved by grace, but do we emphasize I'm a sinner rather than saved by grace? You just realize that we're not just in that prison. We've been redeemed. We've been restored. We've been, we are children of the Most High God. When, when that demon came up to Jesus on that day or the legion of demons he cried out and recognized him. You are the God or the God of the most high. Jesus of the most high God. And he was, he was trembling at the presence of God. I don't tremble in the presence of God. I have the presence of God with me. I'm a child of God. We forget this. I serve and have been called to serve the king of kings. I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God in me. We forget that we have been called to be kingdom builders, not just church goers. And there is a difference. We talked about the greater problem. There was a massive problem in this guy's life. He was miserable. He had an unclean spirit. He was self-mutilating himself. He was out of control. He had chains. He was left in darkness. There was nothing he could do to change him. And then, yes, he encountered a greater power. The demons of hell trembled at the presence of God. They fell at his feet. Jesus came up and said, who are you? Not because Jesus didn't know, but he wanted everybody around to know. When he called out and said, we are legion because we are many. God was saying, listen, how many demons do you have? They are no match for our God. And at the name of Jesus, at the presence of Jesus, at the power of our God... They had to flee. They were begging for mercy. And we pick up in Mark chapter 5 verse 13. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down into a steep place into the sea. And they were about 2,000 talking about the, uh, the swine. And were choked in the sea. And they that were fed the swine... And told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what was done. They took over the swine's body. And let me tell you, when they left, and this is something for us to get. When they left this guy and they were torturing these pigs of the new embodied spirits or presence of them there. They did the same thing that they were doing with them. They came to steal, kill, and destroy. Everything that Satan does is for those purposes. He comes in to steal your family, to steal your joy, to steal the presence of God and, and the joy of God and the joy of church. He comes to kill your relationships. He comes to kill everything that you have and he comes to destroy everything he can touch. Notice verse 15. And they come to Jesus and seeing him that was possessed with the devil that had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that sat told them. Oh, it befall to him that was possessed with the devil. And also concerning the swine. And they began, they began to pray and depart out of their coast. They wanted Jesus out of there. You're messing up our business. You're messing up what we're doing. And he was coming to the ships. He that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Now, now wait a minute. You step back and you go, who was this guy? You know what I'm saying? It's like, you are not the guy that we started this story with. He is not the same person that we were looking at before. What a change, what a difference. We go from being out of control and self-destructive and miserable and crying out and rejected and bound and all of those things to this. 
See, this is simply what happens when God steps into our lives. This is what happens when God takes over. So I'm going to ask Bruce for your, for your last time to come out in chains, dude. Your last time to come out in chains. I, I want you to remember how different this guy is. See, and I like to use props, and so you guys bear with me. This represents so much to us as believers. Whether it's hanging in a church, or it's hanging around your neck, or it's hanging in your car, or on a plaque inside of your house. This represents so much to us as Christians. See, we use the cross a lot because it represents what Christ did for us. It represents that we were once held in our sin, we were held captive... And on the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross, the day that he laid down his life, is the day that my sin, my sin, encountered the blood of Jesus Christ. You guys realize that my sin no, was no match for Christ, and every sin, and every past, and every mistake, and every misery that I had in my life was covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. The sacrifice was made. The substitution happened. The wages of sin was death. The chains of hell and the chains of sin was going to drag us to hell without the step in and the substitute of Jesus Christ. See, the cross represents the love of God. They say we can talk about the love of God and you say, show me the love of God. We point people to the cross saying, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were yet sinners, Christ stepped into our lives. See, Everything that we read about the maniac of Kadera, I see the opposite with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said that Satan has come to kill, seek, and destroy. You think about, we talked about the maniac being chained. Jesus was nailed to a cross. We, we talked about how the maniac had the pain and experienced cutting himself. They, they beat Jesus to the point of almost dying. We talked about the maniac being rejected of the people. Brought into the graves and chained to the tombs. And I can tell you that Jesus was rejected and despised even of his own disciples that ran the other way when Jesus was dying on the cross. Yes, Jesus knows your pain. Everything that you're going through and everything, the cross is representation of the fact that he knows that we had pain and that knows that we've been rejected and the fact that we've had scars and problems and deep rooted issues. In our lives. It was the cross. See but this is what Jesus did. That's no longer your identity. This is now your identity. See. You've got to stop looking at yourself. As a victim of sin. And start looking at yourself as a child of God. When Jesus sees me. He sees the blood. He sees what he did for me. He sees the fact that he covered me with his blood. And he took my place. He doesn't see me as a sinner. He sees me as a child of God that has been saved by the grace of God. How do you view yourself? How do you view yourself? Everything changed on that day. Notice with me in verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him. Now notice this. You got got to see the verbiage here. That was past tense possessed with the devil and had the legion. Was and had our past tense in this passage. He was messed up. You see, you see, Bruce, this is no longer your identity. He had a legion. He once was a slave to those things. You once were possessed. You once were consumed. You once were manipulated. You once were those things. You see how everything that Christ put in there was past tense? It's no longer who you are. He had a legion. He had a bunch of issues. Now you might be saying, well, I still have issues because you, you still have flesh. Bruce, you're still flesh. I'm telling you, you're going to be flesh till the time that God takes us home. You're still going to struggle. But I tell you, the blood of Christ and the relationship that we have with God and the presence of God with us and everything that the cross represents is with me everywhere that I go. You cannot lose it. You cannot just be bad or skip church and all of a sudden God turns his back on you and no longer accounts the blood of Jesus Christ to your record. We know who he was, but can I show you who he is? Number one, let let me show you. He had a legion, and now we find him sitting. you, You say, what does that mean? It shows that this is drastically different than he was before. You see, he that was running before is now at peace. 
He that was the description that was screaming and disturbed and cutting and out of control. The opposite of running to the world and trying to find something. He's now sitting there in peace. Actually, if you read later in scripture in Luke 8.35, it's another account of the gospel that gives us. It says that when they found him, he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. See, everything changes after we encounter Christ. Everything in your life changes. If you are still one of these guys that is running to the world and running to the bars and running to drugs and running to women and running to men, thinking that will satisfy, it will never satisfy you. It's never going to fill the bill. It's never going to fill the void. It's never going to give you joy. It's never going to give you peace. The reason why he was once screaming and now he's sitting, the ones that he was once running and now he's at the feet of Jesus is he found something that he never had before. I can tell you for myself as a Christian, I'm not the man that I used to be. And you're going to say, I know your testimony. You grew up in church. You didn't run the bars and have all those things. You're right. That is not my testimony. But I can tell you this about my testimony. Before I knew Christ, I was still empty. Even going to church, and that's the thing. If you're trying to fill the void because you go to a building or you carry a Bible or you name the name Christ, but you don't have the indwelling, you don't have the presence of God, you're not covered under the blood of Jesus Christ, you are going through the motions and you're missing out on the blessing. Amen. And it's not the same. They came in and all the people of the city came up and they were like, whoa, who's this guy sitting right here? He was sitting, he was clothed. He said, what is that? Well, he got saved, he put some clothes on. See, nakedness was always a symbol of shame. If I take you back to Adam and Eve in the garden, when they realized that they were naked, the Bible says that they went and they hid themselves. And then the Bible, like Jesus, Eve, or God came out and said, who told you that you we were naked? Well, they realized when they sinned, That they were naked and they tried to cover up their nakedness because they were ashamed. Of course, you guys know the story that Jesus stepped in or God and Jesus in the New Testament, our symbolism of God in the Old Testament, sacrificed the animal for the covering of their sin. You see, anytime we read in the Bible of what God does is God gives us that peace. We're no longer reading or we're no longer seeking. We're no longer running. But God clothes us in his righteousness. He's sitting there and he, he had something that he was never had before. The shame of who he was. See, Christ took our shame and covered it. The Bible says that he was in his right mind. The right mind is the same word that means sound mind or sober mind. It means, the self, uh, means self-control, that God puts us back together inside and out. I didn't say perfect. So if any of you are sitting there right now going, I know these people, they're not perfect. You're right, we're not perfect. I am not talking about perfect. But we are talking about changed. See, God does a change in our life. And all of a sudden the Bible says he's in his right mind. I'm going to tell you guys, if you feel like you have to drink or have weed or anything like that to be satisfied or calm, you're not in your right mind. God did not create us to rely on things of the world to have the peace and the joy that we ought to have in our lives. It's not right. It's not right if you think that you have to feel joy or satisfaction or acceptance from people if you've got to sleep around to get it. You're not in your right mind. It's not the way God created you. You don't have to run to the ditches and the, and, and the scumbags of the world in order to get satisfied. You'll never be satisfied that way. Something happened. It clicked in his mind. I don't need all that. I've got all that I need. All of a sudden, he had the right perspective. He had a clear mind. He had the scales pulled off. He had the curtains pulled back. He wasn't blinded to these things anymore. He had an understanding. Everything that Christ did in this passage, he's doing for the glory of God. In Luke chapter 8, verse 39, you don't have to turn there, but it's the same account. He said, he returned, Jesus told him to return to thine own house and show the great things that God has done. You know what? The unclean spirit took him away from his family. That's what all that does. Pornography, drugs, alcohol, lust, greed, bitterness, hate, all that. You know what it does? It takes you away from your family. After Christ took the chains away and he took him this and he says go get back what the devil took from you go get back what i had from you from the very beginning go get it back and i tell you that guy showed up that day as a different daddy and a different husband 
He was changed by the power of God, of what God did inside of his life. Satan tries to ruin our homes and do all these things, and God gave him a right mind, a right perspective on family and love and the world, who we are, what we were created to be for the glory of God. Back in Mark chapter 5, verse 18, and when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed that he might be with him. We see that God changed his desires. His desires changed. Let me, let me ask you, what is your desire? What is your desire? Because right now I'm really bothered when people say that I have been changed and people have no desire for the things of God and no desire to see other people come to know Christ and no desire to be in church and no desire to read their Bible and no desire to worship and no desire to praise if there's no desire, something's wrong. Amen. And I'm not saying you're saying, well, I don't feel like God's called me to be a missionary or something like that. But I tell you, there's something that transpires in our heart. He sat there and he said, what do I have to do to be with you? Should be every one of us. God changed him. He wasn't the man that he was when Jesus showed up. But when Jesus got a hold of him, he changed. He was clothed. He was sitting he was in his right mind, and he had changed desires. But let me show you what Jesus does with all that. Because I promise, Bruce, everybody loves this package. Everybody loves sitting in church and everybody holding that. And I know this is just symbolism of what God did. If I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. God loves me. I, I love serving God and all that. But that God doesn't stop right there. This is where some Christians just park their Christian life. But this is just the beginning the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, for you are bought with a price. Yep. And the whole church sits there and says, praise God, amen. Woo, the man, how good is God? I've been bought with a price. I've been redeemed. I've been restored. I've been pulled out of the pit. And then it says this word, therefore. Oh, stop right there. <laughs> therefore, because of that, because of what I gave you, yes, you are bought with a price, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belongs to God, which are God's. You realize that we've all been called to a higher purpose? And that, Bruce, if you honestly think that anything that God has done in our lives is just for us, and we have the idea that it's just about going to heaven and just about going to church, you've missed the bigger picture of what it's all about. Because God not only changed him on that day, but God commissioned him on that day. This guy was pumped up. He was a new man. He was excited. Look at verse 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home. Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and have compassion on thee. He says, Get up. Hey, Bruce, it's not just about you. What you have done, what God has done in your life, it's not just about you. Bruce, if this is what your job is to do. I want you to proclaim Jesus Christ. You see, it's not just about having it. God told him to go publish it. God told him, saying, you once were the guy that was trapped. You got once the guy that was hurting. But let me tell you, there's a whole lot more guys. Go home to your friends. Go home to your family. Go out to the world. Go to them that are miserable and down and out and trapped and blind and naked and miserable and seeking when they ask you the question, how did you get all this? What did you do to earn it? You can say simply nothing. The Bible says, then tell them that Christ had compassion on you. He gave you what you did not deserve. Christ gave all of us what we did not deserve. See, it's not just about us. So God does great things for us so that we can do great things for him. You realize that everything that we do, everything that we have was for the glory of God, not ourselves. Now, this is going to be a little cheesy, but I want you guys to hang with me, okay? I, I, was, I had, uh, this past week, I went home to be with my parents, and I was helping them do a lot of work around their house. And uh, while I was there, I had the opportunity to uh, do a lot of thinking. And while I'm thinking, I was, uh, had this thought, and I thought, man, God has been really good to me. But do you realize that the Bible says over and over again, whatever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might and do all for the glory of God. 
Everything that you have in your life is not for you. It is not for you. It is for the glory of God. So I'm going to ask you guys, how many of you have been blessed by God? I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to have you move a little. Okay, I, I'm going to say, and if I went around the room, I, I, I'd start asking, and you start giving me all the blessings. Can I tell you this? The Bible says you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, which belongs to God and does not belong to you. Every talent, every dime, every house, every car, every ability to sing, every ability to walk, the ability to talk to people, the ability that you have to clean or build or go or drive or whatever is all for the glory of God. It's all for the glory of God. And the fact that God not only changed us for the glory of God and God not only commissioned us for the glory of God, God also equipped us for the glory of God. And I know what you're thinking. You said equip does not start with a C. There is not a word in the dictionary that I could use there that started with a C. So give me a break, okay? He equipped us. I started thinking about this. I know this is cheesy, but hang with me. You know what, Bruce, what God gave us? God gave us our testimony. It's amazing that I, I could go around this room and I could sit there and talk about you and say, man, I'll tell you who I once was. I can tell you how I used to be in drugs and I used to be in the bars and I used to run around it. Man, let me tell you what God's done for me now. You know, I have an amazing wife. And God's blessed me with kids. And God's blessed me with this job. I'm going to ask you, why did God do all that? You sit there and you're happy with all the success that you have. You realize and God says every bit of that was not for you but was for me. You know what a lot of us do with this? We sit there and God says, I'm going to take care of you. I love you. I'm going to give you a testimony. And we just, we just hold on to it. It's like, what, what do you, is, is, that's great. What are you doing? Who, who have you told? You say that's ridiculous. I'm going to ask you guys right now, how, when's the last time you shared your testimony with anybody? Oh, you love the fact that you're not in rehab. You love the fact that you're not running around with girls anymore and you've got a wife at home and you've got kids at home and you've, you love the fact that you can go to church with all your friends and, and glorify God and enjoy that. But what are you doing with it for the glory of God? You know what the glory of God is? Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Your job every single day of everything that God gives you is to lift up Jesus. To lift up Jesus. You're at work and you say, I'll tell you, man, you, you do great at your job. Hey, hey, let me tell you, if you knew where I came from, if you knew who I once was, if you knew what I once was addicted to, if you knew that, that, that I couldn't keep a job for a long time, if you knew, if you only knew, see, that man was not the man that he used to be. The people of the city came in and was like, whoa, who is this? This guy is clothed and sitting in his right mind and he came home and he knocked on the door and everything was changed in his life. Bruce, will you use that for the glory of God? See, see what God does is he uses it to bring glory to him. We lift up the cross. We lift up salvation. We lift up hope. We give it to the world. We're different. Everything we are and everything we do is for one purpose. And that is to lift up the cross and bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But I want, I want you guys, to, as I, I'm thinking through this, people talk about what they're giving up. What, well, oh man, i got to give everything to God. Did you realize that God doesn't take us from it? God just uses it through us? God doesn't sit there and he says, dude, you still get to have all the joy and the satisfaction and the, the love and everything that has. But now you get greater joy because you're using it to lift up the cross. See, God's and there's something else. I've read in that story, and I'm not trying to read in, into it, but I, I realized that this guy in this story, the first thing God does, or Jesus does in that story, is he sends him back to his house. Go knock on that door. And let them see a dad standing there. They, they'd not seen his dad in, I don't even know how long. They heard him screaming. They knew to beware of that area. They knew that they could never hug their dad or all those things. But that guy was not the same man. And, and, and I know we like, and he went home to his family. Think, just stop for a minute. Just put in a little humanity to this. Imagine knocking on that door. 
And the wife coming in the door holding that four-year-old or three-year-old or bringing, and all of a sudden, tears falling down her face. It, it can't be. Kids, come, stay back just in case, okay? That can't be your daddy. What happened to you? I, we tried everything. What happened to you? How did this change? We tried everything. He realized that God sent him back there for the glory of God because he didn't just say, go back. Do you realize, and I love that passage, how he says, go back and tell them what great things. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. When God does great things in our life, he doesn't do great things for our glory, but for his glory. Every one of us, God has done great things. Let me, let me tell you about the great things that God has done in my life. God's given me a wife that stands by my side and helps me. I worked all these crazy hours at my mom's house and trying to take care of them, and I love them, and redoing their bathroom and all this. And I told my wife, because I worked through a number of the nights, and the last night to get done, I had to work through the night, and it was in the morning, and I had all this adrenaline, and I'm crawling under the house, and I'm doing all this. And my, we were getting in the car, and my wife says, I'm going to drive. I said, babe, I'm fine. I, I, I can drive. I've got so much adrenaline. I'll, I'll drive a few hours, and then we'll take over. She said, I don't think you're fine. And so while I'm loading up the tools, my wife goes to the passenger seat. She reclines the seat, puts my pillow and a blanket there, and she said, that's where you're sitting. You're not driving our family. And I said, babe, I am fine. I'm awake. I'm alert. I'll be fine. No, Jake, by the time we hit the end of the driveway, I was already snoring. I was out. I was, and, and thank God, God gave me a wife that has a lot more common sense than I do. It's, it's just, I, I got to serve the, those days at my mom and dad's. And I got to have my two sons right next to me. And, and they're, they're doing things and they're helping their grandpa and they're doing... Right now, Jordan stayed back in Alabama and we drove him to Michael's house who moves here tomorrow, our new youth pastor. And he's going to drive back with Michael just because it worked out that it was the same weekend. And he's gonna, he helped him load his truck. And I'm not just saying this to brag on my son. The reason why I'm doing that is I'm bragging on my son. That's the reason why I'm doing this. God has blessed me. Amen. And everything that I do, I want my kids and I want my family that we do what we do for the glory of God. Amen. My kids will be here serving with me this week. My son's normally up there running the computer. My other son's singing in the choir. My daughter's singing in the choir. All these different things. And you're just saying, you're just building yourself up or building. No, I'm not. None of this I deserve. It was given to me by God and I got more than I deserve because of the glory of God. Yes. And so many of us, we take the blessing of God in our life and we're sitting there going, well, I hope they uh, graduate, make a, get a good job. And I hope they get that scholar. And guys, I hope they do too. But everyone, if, whatever you do, you do for the glory of God. Right. You lift up the cross and you bring people to you and you serve in your church and everything you have and everything that God is giving you Bruce is for one reason. God says, I'm going to bless you. And I'm telling you, I'm going to bless you and I want you to use that for the glory of God. I've got one more. This is all encompassing right here. Every blessing that God gives you is for the glory of God. And I know that we, we say that you can't outgive God. Let me tell you from experience, you cannot outgive God. Because God takes everything that we give to him and God takes it and God uses it more. And here's the thing. When we're bringing people to Christ, I can't begin to explain to you. If, if, if you're taking care of my wife and kids and meeting their needs and doing all these for them, you don't think you're going to please me? And I, and I know that you're taking care of them. I'm going I'm to keep blessing you because you're blessing me. And every time that we know that we're giving to God or sending out missionaries or building churches and all these things, all of those things give glory to God. Amen. God is honored. God is pleased. God is exalted. And God says, I'm going to bless you. But Bruce, I know what the temptation is. You're going to take that. You're going to want to keep it to yourself. Man, look, what, look at the success that I got. Or I made all this money. And God says, you know what you could do if you use it for my glory instead of yourself? Have you used it because Christ said, if I am lifted up, you realize that the more we give, and the more we serve, the more we do, the more we publish and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ, 
The further our reach in missions, the further our reach with Fellowship Baptist Church, the further our reach with the ministries that we do here, first, God blesses us for the glory of God. He can sit there, and I know you're already thinking, Pastor Dave, God help him, he was sitting there and saying, man, that'd make a good junior church illustration. I'm like, stop it, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. We have been called to a much greater purpose. And I'm, I'm looking over a crowd right now, and I'm, we're, we're rolling in to the Greater Things Project, and, and not everybody has understood what that's going on. We, we have these areas that we're trying to improve. And one of the main things is for people to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. For six weeks, we're going to preach, 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 preach the Word of God. Our, our whole thing that we're trying to do is to discover the things that God has for us and the things that God promised. And I promise that all, not all the subjects that we'll get into will be comfortable. But, but, but through the preaching of God's word, it changes us. But the other things that we want everybody to do is to dig. You've got to dig into God's word. It cannot be just a Sunday or a Wednesday thing. It's got to be an everyday thing. You say, I don't know how to do that. We get that all the time. I don't know how to do that. Before you leave today, we're going to give every person here a devotion book. And we're just simply asking, when the day starts, that all of us do it together. Yep. We are just asking that everybody read, study, and pray together as a church. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're going to come together and we're going to provoke one another to love and to good works. And we're going to sharpen each other. Because that's what we do as believers and Christians. I believe that God has greater things for Fellowship Baptist Church. Amen. For myself, for my family. And for my church. And if we don't sit there and see the bigger vision of God's broke the chains. And then we just sit there and go, okay, you know what? And God says, no, get up. Go, get out of the prison cell. Run to the darkness. Run to those that are still bound in the chains. Those that are still addicted. Those that are still lost. Because they need us.